So let's assume that we're having this discussion now about someone's, you know, come to the point where they realize that they're feeling bad more than they're feeling good. It's not having them feel good at all anymore and they're ready to quit. Okay, so at that point, what will we do? Well, the, the worst thing that you can do, it just makes perfect sense to me, the worst thing you could do is go to a program or, you know, spend time in any kind of a program where the focus is purely on the thing you're trying to leave behind. You know, so if you're sitting there just doing, I'm so-and-so and I'm an addict, and it's just reinforcing you all the time that you're an addict, plus you're hanging out with people that are they're an addict, you go to drug treatment, and like I've said, I have been exposed in part of it, whether it was myself or a family member or someone involved in a program, or I was on the board of a, of a drug court program, um, and then my son, well, I went from the, you know, the most expensive, exclusive kinds of treatment down to, you know, I, I, I mean, I've gone the whole echelon of everything, including alternative treatments, including treatment, treatment with iboga in, in Costa Rica. I took him, I took him for iboga with the, with shaman and the whole thing for nine days. And it was a whole, a whole big thing, including that. So, I mean, really ran the gamut of ultimately what it came down to every time is that he you know he could get clean and he got clean many times but eventually the things that were pulling him into using in the first place were still there and they and they hadn't gone away and I'll talk, I'll do this in another another um, episode is talk about how we deal with the core issues which usually stem from from childhood trauma how we deal with those core issues that are the, are at the root of our addictions so, but it seems to me any any program that I would I would want to come up with would definitely be focusing a lot less on shaming the addict and making the addict focus on being an addict and a lot more on finding the passions and finding the thing finding the core of who the person is. It's all the language in AA is all about powerlessness and uh, character defects and you know, basically things that are wrong with us, ways we've hurt people, how we need to be saved from ourselves. Not the right kind of language for people who already feel pretty bad about themselves. I mean, first of all, my son was someone who was very in touch. And the way that he saw himself was a hundred times worse than anyone else saw him. And so he didn't, you know, he didn't need that drilled into his head. And I went to a program myself and, uh, you know, I was feeling so bad about myself when I got there. And then it really seemed that the program was kind of like had kind of this boot camp philosophy where it was sort of like, we're gonna, you know, beat you all the way down so we can build you back up again kind of thing. And, you know, they just had no idea how far beaten down I already was. Because of course I didn't look it. I mean, I was, I was a survivor. I was a person who, who had been raised to, you know, put a smile on my face and my lipstick on and go out the door and look like I had it together. But I was just a, a broken, broken person when I got there. And so, you know, them thinking that they had to knock me down a few pegs, it was just really far off. I really needed to be loved and I really needed to be um, nurtured and listened to and cared for. And I really, really needed unconditional love and compassion. Really, I did. And, um, I think that's what most addicts need. And I think that a large part of why a lot, a big majority of them are using is because they're in so much pain because their their world, the people in their life, they haven't experienced nearly enough of that. Both of my sons and I had the same problem. We had the same root problem from where, where the depression and all of that came. And that was the fact that we were surrounded by people that we loved and surrounded by people that um, that were abusive, <laughs> that that didn't love us back. If I was, you know, if I was designing a program, I know that it would have to have structure because we need structure, we need steps, and so we'd have to come up with some kind of substitution for the steps. Um, but it would it would all be in much more positive language, and it would all be about um, having our having power and being being good and and being successful and it would be also um, not so attached to 
where I am in my addiction or where I've been in my addiction, but it would be much more focused on where I'm going to go, where I'm going to, who, I, who I'm going to be when I'm at my best, who I was before the addiction even, but who I'm intended to be without this addiction problem. That's, that's more what the language would be like. And then I would put in a lot of this, a lot of the tools and techniques that we can use just to help beef us up, you know, like, which is emotional freedom technique, which is where you tap at certain points as you talk through things that are triggering to you. I did another thing that was similar, it was called EMDR, where you deal with traumatic experiences and you um, hold these little vibrating pallets in your hands and you watch some light bar go back and forth. And it just sort of rewires re the way that your brain is interpreting triggers and the, tr and the traumatic things that have happened. And it sort of takes their charge out. I would say the first thing you need to do is really get in touch with who you are. And I'd start at the end. And this kind of came to me when I was sitting there at my son's vigil. Met my son's vigil. And, you know, I, I haven't had lots of experience with death. I really haven't. I have had lots of experiences with loss. But most of the people that I've lost are still alive. Son's death is it's in its own category all its all its own because that's just that's an incredible kind of pain. But before his death, I would have said that death is the kindest way to lose someone. By far the kindest way to lose someone. The people in my life that had died, they didn't abandon me. And I didn't feel any sense that they abandoned me or that they chose to that they didn't love me. But when when someone abandons you and when they're right there in your life, you're just not important enough to them to be with, you know, they're just choosing not to have you in their life. That's a whole other level of pain. And and when it's your parents, it's a kind of rejection that goes to the bone. And when it when it goes on for years, I mean, you know, even still, even still, even with all the work I've done, there is a little, a little place where it just, it, it hurts me because it just is such a shame and because I know what it cost us and what it especially cost my children and me is that, you know, I know that my son is gone because he was born into a family, because he was a sensitive kid who needed a lot of support and he was born into a family that was an emotionally abusive family. 